so right now I'd like to call to the stage um, for the, the second panel, um, Africa Writing Queer Identity. This um, features uh, Jude Dibia from Nigeria and Graham Reed from South Africa. Um, and it's facilitated by Surajini uh, Nada. So welcome, thank you. Can you guys take to the stage and can we give them a round of applause? and colleagues, um, good evening. I count it a great privilege to facilitate the panel on um, Africa writing queer identity within the broader framework of um, and theme of the festival on writing a new world. Um, I'm even more delighted to have met earlier today these two amazingly gifted authors, um, Jude De Beer and Graham Reed. Uh, Jude De Beer is an accomplished uh, novelist, having published three very wide-ranging um, novels. And um, Graham Reed has edited various books, um, is an anthropologist by training. And tonight we are going to focus on um, two books, um, the one by Graham Reed, How to Be a Real Gay, Gay Identities in Small Town South Africa, and Walking with Shadows, which is a novel by Jude um, De Beer. Um, so this one is an academic book based on Graham Reed's um, research, and of course Jude De Beer's um, book is a novel. Um, nevertheless, we had a discussion earlier that although one is an academic book and the other is a novel and um, hence fiction, that um, I think what Brene Brown says about um, her research uh, when she collects stories. She says, stories are just data with soul. And so in a sense, I think earlier uh, we were having this discussion about, um, uh, Joanne was saying about how um, you know, so much of what is in fiction actually mirrors reality. And so I don't think they, they are much different actually, both the academic book and um, the novel. Um, so we met earlier today and had wonderful discussions over cappuccinos on each of their books and what brought them to writing. We also had a discussion on how to structure this panel and agreed that we would facilitate it along um, the lines of three themes. And the themes that we chose, the first theme is gendered identities in general and queer identities in particular. The second theme is African culture in the context of queer identities, focusing particularly on the popular held notion that homosexuality is un-African. And of course, I thought Sukiswa was going to hijack that for a bit in the last session. Um, the third theme is focusing on the so what question. Um, looking at, I mean, I think that the, the, the theme of this, uh, of the festival, Writing a New World, calls our attention precisely to that, the so what. What does our writing do? What difference does our writing make um, in the world? So the way in which we will structure the conversation is that I will engage the writers on each of the themes, which they will talk through by reading um, excerpts from their books. And thereafter, we will open up to the audience for um, questions and comments. Um, I have to say, unlike in the previous panel, we don't have books to give away for clever questions, but I have uh, negotiated with these dashing authors, and they might be willing to part with their phone numbers, so <laughs> keep the questions clever. <laughs> Okay, so let's, let's kick off the conversation with the first theme, um, the construction of gendered identities, and more specifically uh, in each of your writings, um, how the construction of identities um, happens. Um, Ellen DeGeneres, who uh, always says the quirkiest of things, as you know, is quoted as saying, to ask who the man is and who the woman is in a same-sex relationship is like asking which of the chopsticks is the fork. <laughs> so we had some discussion on this earlier, and each of you had some wonderful excerpts from your books um, that talk about the way in which queer identity is constructed. So I'm going to hand over to maybe Jude first to read um, a little excerpt from his book, and then maybe uh, Graham afterward, and then we can engage in some conversation. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, before I read, I just wanted to give you the context of um, the excerpts I'm going to be reading from. Um, my novel actually was birthed while I was asking myself a lot of questions about um, what if there's this man that's married to a woman and they have a child and everything was wonderful and rosy, but he has a dark secret, but he has been good, really good. And then all of a sudden, he's outed. And um, for some reason, he doesn't want to deny his sexuality anymore. And, um, and the questions went further than that to how would his family accept him? How would his friends, how would his colleagues, what will he do with himself and all of that? All those questions just came coming and all of a sudden I had a book that I had to just write. Um, the essay I'm going to read from is um, dealing with his wife or rather his wife's cousin who has a child that she suspects um, might be gay. So um, I will just read a little bit from there and then um, we'll take it up. She couldn't believe she had been so wrong about Adrian, or had she? He was a nice person, but he was gay. This was definitely not right. Being a strong Christian, she could not be tolerant of such. It went against all her morals, and she could imagine that her past and she could imagine what her pastor would say about people like Adrian. Just then, there was a loud scream and running feet. She looked up and saw Junior, her son, running past with a doll, and following him with tears in, in her eyes was Candy, his little sister. Ego was walking behind with a confused look in her eyes. What is it, Candy? Nkechi asked. Junior took my doll again, she cried. He's always playing with my dolls. Something in what Candy said triggered off an alarm in Nkechi's head. She had never taken much notice of it before, but it was all now all too clear. Her son was always playing with his sister's doll, even though he had his own toys and football. He didn't have much interest in his toys and was usually too quiet and withdrawn. Was this how it all began? Was this how, it, was this how if left unchecked, her son could become an Adrian? Junior, she screamed at the top of her lungs. Junior, would you come here right now? Her scream brought with it a chill. It immediately silenced the crying candy and made Ego freeze where she was standing. When Junior slowly traced his steps back into the living room, he looked like he had shrunk into himself, cowering with the doll held out in his arms as if he was offering. He was, sorry, I'll take that again. He looked like he had shrunk into himself, cowering with the doll held out in his outstretched arms as if offering arms. Nkechi grabbed the doll from him and without thinking slapped him across the face with the back of her hands. Boys don't play with dolls, she said harshly. Do you hear me? Yes, mommy, Junior sniffled as tears rolled down his eyes and he ran, his, and he ran up to his room. Here you go, darling, Nkechi said, offering the repossessed doll to Candy. Candy did not move from the spot where she had been standing when her mother hit Junior. Neither did she reach out to take the doll. Her young mind could not understand the rage that had suddenly possessed her mother. Her mother had never hit any one of them in that fashion before. Candy, Nkechi called out, take your doll and go play with Ego. No, Candy shook her head. As the tears formed in her eyes, she ran off in the same fashion as Junior, as Junior did earlier. Later that night, while she was in bed with her husband, Obi, she could not shake off the feeling of worry and anxiety that plagued her mind. If someone as decent looking as Adrian was gay, then how many more men out there was living double lives as well? She had always thought gay men were effeminate and wanted to play girls. This was why she was worried about her son. He seemed too soft for a boy. What is the matter? Ubi asked. Nothing, she lied. Come on, tell me. Something is obviously worrying you. You've been tossing and turning all night. I hit Junior today, she blotted out. Why? He was playing with Candy's doll again, she says, turning around so their eyes could meet. Again, he said quizzically. In Kichi, he's just a child. That's what they do, play. He's always playing with dolls. I never see him playing with other boys outside. He has footballs, he has other toys, but he prefers to play with Candy's dolls. 
He will agree with NKG, will be, will be reassured her. He's just a kid. He's eight years old, she said. I'm afraid he's going to become like one of those sissies. What are you saying? Have you ever wondered about how many homosexuals are out there, she asked. If as parents we don't monitor our children and guide them in the right path, they could make, the, the wrong, they could make wrong choices later in life. Obi sat up and was staring at her strangely. Are you saying our son is homosexual? I'm saying that our son is playing with dolls like a girl, she said. And if we don't correct it now, he will carry on till he's in his teens and young adulthood. And one day, he will be confused about whom to love sexually. The silence that followed was both uncomfortable and tense. Obi got out of bed and rested his head on the full-length mirror adjacent to the bed. He could not bear to look at his wife just that minute. My son is not homosexual, he said between clenched teeth. And don't you ever lift your finger to, to strike him again. And Kiji covered her face with her hands and began to cry. She wanted to tell him that she had every reason to be concerned, that she was responsible for her cousin being married to a homosexual, but she couldn't. She had promised Ada she could tell no one, especially family members. How would he understand that their son was not acting like the same, was not acting the same as other boys his age? She could not bear the thought of raising a boy who would turn out not to be a real man. How could he possibly understand? Thank you. Okay, um, the context of this particular extract that I'm going to read would uh, contradict Ellen DeGeneres' remark quite strongly. And um, it was one of the first uh, interactions that I had when I was started doing my research in 2003, and it precedes the time that um, same-sex marriage was legal in, in South Africa. On 12 December 2003, in the early evening, a group of ladies find themselves outside the lo local supermarket in Ermelo, surrounded by shopping bags, looking tired, a trifle stressed, primarily exuberant. These ladies are, in fact, young men. I arrive, and my car is soon loaded with as many ladies and groceries as can fit in. I drive to Wesselton Township, situated on the outskirts of Ermelo, and park the car outside Booty's place. Booty stays in a room next to a busy, noisy shabine full of thieves, remarks Henry, a visitor from Standerton, and he is perhaps right. Later tonight, Booty will throw three unwelcome male guests from his room, accused of theft and attempted rape of one of the ladies. But that is later. For now, arrangements are still in full swing for the engagement that is to take place in Ermelo tomorrow afternoon. Once the groceries are offloaded, I again drive back towards town. A symphony of cell phone ringtones and snippets of conversation. Hello, sweetheart. Thank you, darling. And Tom Bazzani accompanies the jolly talk in the car. <laughs> Word has reached Andrew, the bride-to-be, that Bruce from Durban has arrived and is waiting at the taxi rank in town. Andrew has invited Bruce to the engagement as a blind date for Tsepo. As we travel towards the taxi rank, all attention is focused on Tsepo, who is animated with anticipation. He touches up his hair playfully in the mirror and briefly brushes a piece of imaginary fluff from his shirt pocket. Andrew alights to find Bruce, and once out of earshot, someone exclaims in the spirit of jolly talk, you can see that the bride is a bitch. He knows all these men. <laughs> there are a few tense speculative moments as we wait to see the elusive Bruce who travels light, a bag slung over his shoulder. He is handsome and aware of his good looks. A beret sits askance on his head in a gesture of masculine bravado. This blind date is to end in heartbreak, a discussion on the nature of betrayal with Tip or resolving to find a white boyfriend. But we don't know that yet, and in the meantime we share with Tip or his sense of initial excitement as, and his dreams of romance, kindled at this moment by a frisson of lust. Meanwhile, the groom, Tabo, is hungry, he calls Andrew several times on his cell phone, demanding to know when supper will be ready. In the car, there's talk of divorce before marriage, because the groom is already hungry and wondering where his bride-to-be is. Andrew pacifies him over the phone until we get back to Booty's place. At Booty's place, the groom and his friends are sitting separately from the ladies, smoking, drinking Hunter's Gold, and waiting for supper. It's a very masculine space. 
It's in this room that the groom tells his friends that he is only doing it for the money. In the next room, the kitchen is a hive of activity as groceries are unpacked and supper is prepared by the ladies amidst laughter and chatter. Thank you. So let's go back to Ellen DeGeneres then. <laughs> um, the idea that um, that in same-sex relationships exists the possibility for egalitarian relationship. And yet I'm hearing your research saying something different. And, and your novel, in a sense, calling into question these easy dichotomies um, between what is masculine and what is feminine. Do you want to say more about that? And perhaps something about the title of your book as well. All right. Uh, I'll start with the, the title, How to Be a Real Gay. And the title comes from a series of workshops that was run by a more politicized gay person who spent quite a lot of time in Johannesburg and who interacted with political organizations there. And he ran a series of workshops in Ermelo and surrounding towns because he felt that the local gays needed to be educated about how to be a real gay. And what that really meant is that he saw that gays were accepted, but he said they were accepted as women and not as gay. So the idea was to produce a different kind of gay identity, a gay identity that resonated with the democratic project, with the uh, inclusion of sexual orientation in the Constitution, and that in some ways downplayed the gender dichotomy so that people were encouraged not to cross-dress all the time. And there was a conflict within the local communities about what constituted a real gay. So people started to be labeled transgender, for example, people who constantly cross-dressed. And they resisted that label, saying, but we are the real gays. Who do you think you are? You don't even know how to dress. What are these new ideas? You're clearly the imposters. <laughs> so there was this kind of conflict that was going on on a local level. And it seemed to me interesting about you know, questions around gender and gender identity. And just to answer your question, I think you know, there are many ways of imagining what it means to be gay. And in this particular community, which is not unique, is there's a very strong investment on a gender dichotomy, that between ladies and gents. And incidentally, the gents are not seen as gay and don't see themselves as gay. In fact, to be sexually desirable to a gay man, you need to be straight. Oh. So will the real gay please stand up? <laughs> Jude. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go back to the conversation we had earlier in the morning where I had an issue with with the whole thing. Um, there are relationships in the gay culture that are, like he said, um, both masculine looking types. And then you could have um, relationship with both feminine looking types. And then you have the ones that reflect more masculine and more feminine types. I don't think it's, there's nothing that's so um, clear, black and white about the whole thing. Um, the reason why I used this illustration was that people definitely, I'm, I'm of the opinion people are born the way they are. And then you have things like kids who show certain identity. I wouldn't use the word sexuality like we said this morning, because as a child you don't understand sex or what it means or the context of sex itself. You only understand who you are as a person, as an identity. I remember, um, this was last month I think, it happened in the UK when a kid was kind of ejected from school because he wanted to be using the female toilets, but he was a male guy or something like that. And then, you know, we are born with certain things that are ingrained in us. And I wanted to illustrate that using this child. Yes, he likes to play with dolls. Yes, he's more effeminate, as they would say. But that is his own identity. It could be that the next gay person is more masculine that likes football and fast cars. You know? So playing with this kind of stuff in, in storytelling for me was actually quite important. Okay. So clearly, um, creating um, in, in, your, in your works, what you're doing is actually um, showing how queer identity actually shows up um, the, uh, the absurdity almost of the way in which we construct gender as masculine and feminine and, and, and how that, that, that dichotomy is so, so troubled. Um, I think we should move to the next theme. Um, and we sort of label this theme generally uh, um, uh, around the notion of homosexuality being 
I'm African, mm -hmm. and we wanted to focus specifically on the issue of religion and culture, because both in your novel, um, that comes out quite clearly. In fact, the, the first uh, the book opens with the main character being baptized um, out of his identity, almost. <laughs> his, 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 um, when he, he, uh, he's immersed into the water, he, um, he's asked by the priest, when you come up, um, um, wh who are you going to be? And he chooses to be Saint Adrian. Yeah. And so, um, you know, religion comes out as a very strong uh, feature in, in the novel. And, and Graham and you as well, there's, there's, there's a lot of the church uh, stuff there. Um, but also the, uh, the, the one I, I said to Graham, I was reading the book in a seminar on Saturday and I had to laugh out loud and I have to read this line to you before Graham reads his. <laughs> His, um, because he was looking at how Sangomas um, uh, uh, are in same-sex relationships and how common this is in, in small town South Africa. Uh, uh, South Africa, and he says, if many Sangomas are gay, and it appears to be the second most popular form of work for gays, second only to hairstyling, they have a strong <laughs> ideological value in discussions about homosexuality and African culture. But I'll, I'll let them each read, read from their, their books. All right, the extract that I'm going to read is a, um, is a short extract, and the context in which it takes place is a funeral of a, of a hairstylist, one of the very prominent and well-known hairstylists. It was a, um, a funeral that was very w widely attended from both Ermelo and surrounding towns, and one of the people attending the funeral remarked, this is the funeral of a celebrity, and indeed it had that quality. And so um, this is, uh, that's the background to this extract. It seemed that, aside from being considered a less than devout member of his own congregation, Dumasani had found a niche in even the most conservative of communities. His close friend, Nati, had certainly found a home within his own church community, one of the many independent African churches that fall under the broad umbrella of Zionist groups. Nati felt that while Dumasani had referred been, was referred to by the priest at the funeral as he, which was Dumasani's choice, Nyati would prefer to be referred to as she when the inevitable day came. He said he would inform his fellow congregants at the Ethiopian Holy Baptist Church in Zion of his wishes. It was a request that would be unlikely to encounter any argument given that Nyati was a fully fledged member of his church wearing the women's uniform and participating in all the female activities of a church community that was highly differentiated in terms of gender roles and responsibilities. When I asked one of the women congregants why she wore a starched white shawl, which distinguished her and a small group of women from others in the church, she explained, if you are married or a mother, you wear it. You see, Nati is not a mother and is not married, so she just wears without the shawl. Nati really is considered a woman, although it is known that he is gay. When I questioned church members about Nati's integration as a gay within the church community, my line of questioning was met with incomprehension. People said that she was a good singer, an indispensable part of the choir where she sang soprano. <laughs> she was a very devoted church member who attended regularly, and she was a personable presence in the church. There did not seem to be any plausible reason as to why she would not be accepted. The issue of her being gay did not come up. She had the status of an unmarried woman in the church. They accept me very much. They love me. They take me as a girl, said Nati. Nati said that he chose this particular branch of the church to worship in because the guys there are so cute. <laughs> why we all go to church. <laughs> all right, since you mentioned the, the opening of my novel, I wanted to read something else before, but I think I should just read the beginning part, yeah. If Billy was going to die today, he knew it. He welcomed it. He was simply going to let it happen so that Adrian could be born. He, he only hoped it, it would be painless. It should be painless. After all, he was surrounded by hundreds of black angels in gleaming white robes, just like himself, waiting to be reborn, though most of them did not know it yet. This was the day for rebirths. He looked ahead of the crowd and picked out his brothers, Chiedu and Chika, 
also invite with their hands clasped together prayerfully. How innocent they looked, how Christ-like. This was a good enough day to be reborn, and Ibele could not have chosen a better location for this. His 10-year-old mind was in a hurry to rid itself of the pathetic person it, was, it had always known as Ibele. Ibele looked again at the long chain of people ahead of him, and he found his, himself exi- reciting in his heart, Ringo, Ringo roses, a pocket full of poses. He loved that game, the running around in circles, singing and chasing his shadows. But he had been told that he was not supposed to like that game. It was not a manly game, and he was often laughed at when he played this game with the girls. After today, I would have to pl- he wouldn't have to play that game again. He would be a new person. Soon, he was at the foot of the stream, and it was his turn to be baptized and be reborn, and Ibele would fade away and die. The pastor motioned for him to come forward, and Ibele slowly entered the stream and stopped in front of him and his clergyman. In panic, he realized that the water level was just above his stomach. He could not swim. He could drown, he thought stupidly. Of course he couldn't. That was why the two clergymen were there to hold him on, to hold on to him while he was lowered into the water. What patron, what patron saint have you chosen to be named after the pastor demanded? Saint Adrian, he answered in a whisper. Saint Adrian, the pastor repeated in bewilderment. Yes, sir. The, bur- the burly pastor considered him for a minute longer before he started praying. He took hold of Ebele and slowly lowered him into the water. Submerging deep into the water, Ebele felt the hands of the clergyman hold him still to prevent a struggle, and again he began to panic. He closed his eyes tightly. He believed that if he closed his eyes tight enough, it would happen. Ebele would fade away, and Adrian would emerge. Yes, he would close his eyes and keep them tightly closed. In the fuzzy red and black darkness that lurked behind his closed eyelids, he could only hear the funny rushing flow of the stream and he could make out faintly the sound of the pastor's voice in prayer. He panicked again. This felt long. Was this the same amount of time the others were submerged in the stream? Or was it only his imagination that he was there longer than the others? He gave up his thought as he truly felt himself fading away. He was not going to struggle with this drowning sensation. He was simply going to let himself go. It was like falling asleep at the bottom of the sea. Thank you. that opening quite painful actually but I think that would stimulate some some questions and discussion um, uh, incidentally Jude um, uh, Graham said earlier that he's a reluctant atheist and Jude said he's a reluctant Catholic <laughs> um, we move now to the third theme um, writing a new world um, Arundhati Roy says another world is not only possible she is on her way On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Is another world that is less homophobic truly possible? And how do you address this um, in your writings? Um, Um, I I think every every day is a new day, is a new world. Uh, In my writing, I try to not be political in that sense, but to be quite objective, I ask questions. Because as a writer myself, I am always asking questions. I'll use an example with Walk in the Shadows. Um, it was a very interesting book to write. At the time I wrote it, the government in my country were advocating for a legislation that would actually punish gay people. And, um, and of course, there were a lot of people talking about it and were saying, oh, yes, kill the gays, kill the gays. And my brother, my, my kid brother, had a boss who was very homophobic. And he calls me up and he says, I'd like you to give me a copy of your book. And I said, for what? He said, for his boss. I said, okay. So I gave it to him. And he gave it to his boss for his Christmas gift. And um, he came back in December, called my brother into his office and said, you know, before I read your brother's book, I always had this impression about gay people as being dirty and evil and, you know. And um, after reading his book, I, I kind of understand them better. And I don't think I'll be that negative towards gay people. Now, if a book, a fiction book can do that to just one person, you've actually changed the world. Mm. So that's my own 
you know, that's my own perception of it as, as well. Yeah. Thanks, Jude. Yeah. I mean, I think in some senses that the intention of this book or the research that went into this book was to excavate what already exists in terms of that kind of goodwill that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. that kind. So it is the case, and not to downplay it, that there's a, 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 you know, a high level of violence and that there's sometimes a strong homophobic rhetoric in spite of the gains of the constitution here, which let's remember is, was a precedent setting internationally what took place here and South Africa continues to play a lead role internationally. But what I was interested in is what happens in a context like the Zionist church for instance. Now there's a syncretic church drawing on elements of African tradition and Christianity. One would expect it to be a particularly conservative space. And yet it's the most popular church community amongst gay people living in the small towns. And Nati, the uh, extract that I read that referred to Nati, that was very significant because Nati's singing was seen to be able to help produce an environment that was conducive to inviting the Holy Spirit to come and do the healing work of the church. Now that's very much also a traditional role in terms of the sangoma that you referred to and the healer, is that that form of gender or sexual ambiguity, that being between the world of the living and the world of the ancestors, that liminal space can be a source of power and respect and not necessarily a source of condemnation and rejection. So in part it's to see what's already there and the kinds of ways in which people find to live creative lives and the acceptance that they find within um, communities such as the Zionist Christian Church. Thank you. It's clear that you both are indeed writing a new world um, through your writings. I think we have about 15 minutes, Steve, to open up for comments, questions, discussions. I think we'll take three at a time. They'll all go at once. And remember, their phone numbers are up for grabs. <laughs> so make them clever questions. Oh, now all the hands went up. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yeah, uh, my question, I think you have answered it with the issue of the Sangoma. As an, you've answered it, uh, Graham, with this whole uh, androgynous, I don't know if the androgyny is the right word, but that uh, space. Um, oh. But anyway, in, quickly, the question is, in your research, how did you, um, uh, how, yeah, what? All right, I saw people raising hands. Okay, how did, uh, how do you, how, in your research, how did you explain, how did you get people to explain this whole, like, because I found a lot of Sangomas uh, that, that are gay. I was doing some work somewhere, but I found it, oh, Sangomas are gay, but then how come in their own community I find also the same homophobia? So how is that? Play, how did that play out in your research? How did you, I mean, what did you get? What did you find out? Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, violence against gay people, but at the same time, there are some women who are accepted, loved, and embraced in the community, but they are known to be kind of gay. Thank you. Shall we take two more, Graham and Jude? Thank you. Um, two more. We'll take two more questions and then ask the writers. I see two hands. Hi. Uh, just a, a question. Um, I've been recently reading a lot of um, books. I'm, I'm also a reluctant Catholic. <laughs> I've been <laughs> reading a lot of books um, surprisingly written by um, Catholic priests, but more mystics in a sense. Um, and some of them were writing in the 14th century, and two of the main guys I've been reading actually died in the 1990s. And they've all worked with marginalized people. And I, you know, there've always been um, same-sex relationships and these priests and spiritual people that I'm reading use a lot of marginalized people, whether it's gay people or handicapped people, as the greatest teachers. And I'm just wondering, you know, if, if these people lived so long ago and they've learned so many lessons, I just feel like we're currently in such a judgmental society where 
it's almost popular to be homophobic. It's, it's popular to have struggles. And I just wonder if, if people 20 years ago were already exploring these issues of discrimination, actually dealing with them, why are we still so aggressively, why is it so much in the forefront now and so aggressively in the forefront? It's just a question. Oh, thank you. Um, hi, I'm, I'm presently conducting my research on the intersection of xenophobia and homophobia. And Graham, I really like your idea of gays as cultural brokers to bring about change in, in South Africa. And on a day-to-day -day level, it seems that there's a, this popular conflation of gender identity with sexual orientation. And my question is, how useful is queerness as a concept? How useful is queer theory, which is historically a very westernized concept in understanding same-sex sexual identities um, and interactions in the African context. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to give the authors a chance to respond. Did you get all the questions? You can choose which ones you're going to respond. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that the Sangoma question was directed specifically to me, and I, you know, I think it's a mixed bag. Certainly there is violence, certainly there is discrimination, um, and also there's a, a level of acceptance. And I think the, you know, the Sangoma role also does offer a measure of protection. One of the people who, uh, who I write about in the book says that, well, he's sometimes teased, he's particularly effeminate, and he's sometimes teased, but when he wears his Sangoma outfit, people leave him alone. So there's a way in which people are a bit afraid of him um, because of that. Um, I think that it's important, you know, to think about the way, the kind of political economy of homophobia, I guess, is that to what extent is it used? Often, you, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa it's very clear, but obviously elsewhere in the world is that it's, it's used as a moral panic to... Um, for political ends, for narrow political ends. So we see that very clearly, for example, in Uganda, the way in which the anti-homosexuality bill appears and then disappears and appears and disappears. Or in Zimbabwe, for instance, that you know, it comes around like clockwork when there's an election or a referendum, that, that <laughs> the homophobia is also then present. So it, it serves a particular social purpose in that, in that respect. In terms of queer theory, I mean, I guess I'm fairly ambivalent about that. Certainly in terms of... Um, the hybridity of identity, the, um, the constructed nature of identity, all of those basic concepts are very important and I think, you know, are not culturally specific in that sense. That to a certain extent queer theory breaks out of those um, identity categories that are essentially very Western. And in fact, the some of the Western presumptions are sometimes exceptional rather than the norm. And so it disrupts that, that, um, the, some of those assumptions. So in that sense, I think it's very useful. Um, um, if I may just add um, about the question about the sang Sangoma, um, my colleague Isabel Piri and myself have supervised a master's student who's just completed her research precisely in that area. And one of the things that she found was that um, Sangomas find it easier to explain their sexual orientation in terms of spirit possession rather than sexual orientation. So the, the explanation is that they are possessed, uh, at least for the female uh, traditional healers, that they are possessed by the spirit of a male ancestor and therefore engage in same-sex uh, relationships. But she was trying to figure out whether that's just because it's safer to say that than it is. Um, I'm not sure that she's resolved that, but that's what her, her research has shown. Jude. Well, just to add to the Sagoma thing, it's just like I said earlier, while well, we had our discussion, that there's something similar in Nigeria as well called the Dan Dauda mm. from the Northern Tribe. It's practically the same thing. People revert them when they're in their attire, but if they're out of it, they could be attacked. Yeah. So I guess there's a similarity there to what um, Graham said. And um, regarding the issue of marginalization, I really, really can't say much about that. I don't know. I don't understand the church myself. That's why I'm a reluctant Catholic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess um, people like to use the Bible and the book of Leviticus to 
to justify why they hate gay people. And in the same book of Leviticus, we have a lot of things that says you can't eat shellfish, you shouldn't wear um, mixed clothing or something like that, fabrics, and the man shouldn't cut his hair, or I don't know, all those kind of rules. But we seem to choose what suits us and whatsoever. So the Bible still baffles me as well. So. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have time for one more round of questions. Okay, okay. one more round of questions. Three questions I see here, and I see Cheryl, and... Okay, I see the queue. So, okay, and then you can come here. I want to respond to the question at the back on xenophobia. Maybe just to mention, there's a text, it's a fairly old text called Homophobia is a Weapon of Racism and Sexism. So maybe you can draw the analogy in terms of xenophobia and homophobia. Um, I was also going to probably make the same remark that Graham made about Ellen. Um, but Graham, as you maybe know, I had published an article in a when I edited the journal on the guest edited the journal of agenda, which focused on homosexuality in Africa. And I probably interviewed some of the same people that you may have interviewed in Ermelo because it was on the R50. It's, it's, it's in that area. But, and I've been trying for the last 10 or 15 years to understand the phenomena that we're engaging with. And we know that it's, it's also particular in South America and particular in working class areas where we, in terms of men. But I'm wondering what would your thought be in terms of the fact, let's take the people, the guy that you speak about in the Zionist church and, and all the other people, men that you had interviewed and that I've interviewed as well. Is, are they accepted because they take on um, an identity which I have referred to as compulsory femininity and that's the way that they are accepted or that's the reason why they accept it. I also want to make another comment and that this evening, but it, it's, it's reflecting in terms of the, the novel and the work that Graham has done, that one needs to remember then we, that when we talk about sexual orientation, we must not marginalize uh, lesbians because not all gays are men. And there's the role of women that, because there's the paucity in terms of research and novels in terms of uh, lesbian identities. Thank you. Um, is it up here? Yes. Okay. Um, just to tag on to that, <laughs> my novel does talk about lesbians. Yeah. Okay. So, why do you think on a continent where so much that is not African, so much, for example, la European language and, and some European culture, we're on a continent where so much that is not originally African is embraced, why do you think that calling homosexuality un-African has been such a unifying thing? Why is it that we can be so, we can reject our own languages, we can reject different parts of our cultures and embrace European culture, but calling something un-African, calling homosexuality un-African has brought so many people together and has been such a good reason for people. As people have seen that as a good reason to completely reject um, gay people in Africa. Did we have one more? Right at the back. Uh, I'd like to know what inspires Graham to write his book, How to Be a Red Gay. And uh, as a young writer, I'd like to know what challenges do they come across before they publish their books, if that is possible? Thank you. Thank you. Over to Jude and Graham. Okay, I will just quickly take one that um, Cheryl said. In my book, they're actually lesbians as well. So it <laughs> wasn't mentioned. <laughs> um, your question regarding why is, why is the gay identity or gay tag um, unified a lot of people in, in Africa, whereas we've rejected so many of the things that are African as well. Um, I kind of think it's because of the kind of society that we've allowed ourselves to build, which is very patriarchal. It has to do with patriarchal hierarchy and, and, and systems. And once that is threatened, people just get very 
um, agitated. And also the fact that um, the, the whole idea of sex and, and sexuality has always been a private thing for Africans. And all of a sudden, in this day and age, we are forced to be open about it and to talk openly about sexuality and all of that. And it makes people a bit uncomfortable, I guess. And that's why it probably should remain private. But um, I'm sure there are deeper things in, in connection to that. And the fact that the Bible and the Quran has played a huge role in really unifying people. We've, uh, we've embraced that to be more African than any other thing. And um, back home when people say, oh, this is totally un-African, I always ask them, is Christianity African in the first place? Or is Islam African? And then they just shut up. They really can't say much about that. So, um, I mean, there, there are ways to tackle this, but um, I'm not an, you know, I don't work in the, in the systems where I can understand everything. I'm just a writer. I observe and I write. And um, I try to sensitize people. And, um, yeah, so that's uh, what I do. Yeah. Okay, I'll start in response to that. And um, in the form of an anecdote is... At one stage, I was doing research around a series of hearings, public hearings that the National House of Traditional Leaders was holding throughout South Africa. This was when uh, the Constitutional Court ruling first ruled that the existing marriage bill was um, unconstitutional, but before the main public hearings. And I spent quite a lot of time with one of the officials from the National House of Traditional Leaders. We spent, um, you, you know, we got chatting, we traveled around to some of the hearings, and I had a lot of conversations with him about this question about African culture and, you know, really pressing him on, well, what is the, what, what exactly do you mean by this and what do you mean by that? And eventually, in exasperation, he turned around to me and he said, Graham, you're the anthropologist. You tell me. I don't know. And the point that he was making there is, I'm, I grew up in an urban area that I, I have a sense of what African culture is or what I'm talking about. I sometimes don't know the details because my life is a hybrid um, compilation of many different influences and different aspects. And I think that, in a sense, that's kind of um, instructive, is that you know, African culture is often spoken about as if it's this monolithic entity, which, of course, um, of course it isn't. And I don't know why, uh, you know, it's hard to answer specifically. I think one needs to be careful to look specifically at a particular country to look at what's going on at that time and that place as to why there's a rise of homophobia. So why is it happening in Russia at the moment, for instance? You'd need to understand something about that. But in post-colonial Africa, it's become very, very uh, prominent. And, you know, there's a certain arrogance also in the West, given that these laws are colonial in origin, and were by and large imposed because of a misconception about African sexuality and a kind of African promiscuity, and all these laws were set in place in order to contain that. And now there's, you know, a lot of countries are saying that, well, Africans are not kind of permissive enough. Uh, so again, there's a way in which it's tied up with, with, uh, with uh, colonial and post-colonial politics within sub-Saharan Africa, which makes it particularly emotive and particularly difficult issue um, to challenge. I absolutely accept the idea. You know, it's a complicated thing because the ladies do not challenge gender norms and roles. And so there's a way in which they accept it, and it's very different for women who do. So a butch lesbian is very quickly put in her place, right? Because it is a challenge to those gender norms and roles. However, there's also an element in which the ladies see that very much as part of their own identity. And, you know, I think we also need to understand the agency that goes into that and the idea of erotics and desire that's linked up with this gender dichotomy. Um, and I think also just to note that Zetu Matabeni has done a fantastic study, which I, I, I hope to see um, published soon on black lesbian identity in Johannesburg which is a, a really um, groundbreaking study, I would say. And then the young person who asked me about um, what motivated me, I was motivated by the question of like, this idea about homosexuality being un-African, but, and here I've got an opportunity to give a plug to my publishers, I was had a fantastic publisher, University of KwaZulu-Natal Press, who were really very, very persistent 
um, in helping me to get this book published. So thank you to Deborah Primer and Louis Geiger, who are both here in the audience, for really um, being persistent in, in ensuring that this book finally came out. Thank you. I think um, that's all we have time for. I want to end um, by uh, relating the anecdote about uh, Mazi Hirono, um, who is the first immigrant um, woman uh, to be elected to the U.S. Senate. And, um, of course, she's the only woman of color and the only female um, immigrant, and she's Buddhist. And so someone said to her, um, you know, you're the first woman of color, you're the first... Um, Buddhist, you're the first immigrant woman, but are you gay? And she said, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. <laughs>